Uh, thank you very much. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name's Bob Fitzpatrick. I'm the business development leader for Raytheon Integrated Defense Systems. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next keynote speaker, Vice Admiral Bill Mertz. A native of San Diego and a graduate of the Naval Academy, Catholic University, and the Naval War College, Vice Admiral Mertz's career has included nine overseas deployments and missions across the spectrum of submarine operations in support of U.S. Pacific Command, U.S. European Command, U.S. CENTCOM, and U.S. AFRICOM. Affectionately, I put down the underseas warfighter, warfighter. So it's great to have him. Then I got to spend a little time reading through his bio even further. His flag assignments have included Commander, Naval, Mine, and Anti-Submarine Warfare Command, and Task Force 77 in San Diego. Commander, Task Force 54 in Bahrain. Commander, Task Force 74 in Japan. And Director, Undersea Warfare Division in the Pentagon. Vice Admiral Mertz assumed his current Pentagon assignment as Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Warfare Systems in August of last year. In this capacity, he is the Navy's lead requirements officer for land, surface, undersea, and air domains, special programs, accelerated acquisition, and urgent operational needs. What don't you do, sir? I mean, it's <laughs> awesome. Admiral, thank you for your service, for joining us this morning. It's an honor to have you as with us today, representing the Navy's Warfighter Warfighter. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, well, thanks, Bob. Um, you may have to bear with me a little bit. I got a little bit of a cold working here, um, but uh, we'll plow through. So it's certainly wonderful to be here and to be a part of this conference. Uh, it's always great for a submariner to be back in New England, and I personally spent the bulk of my career, you know, from the open air bridge of a submarine uh, operating in and out of New London, Connecticut, uh, dodging fishermen throughout Long Island Sound, Narragansett Bay, Montauk, uh, and beyond. Um, I don't remember too many days like this uh, operating in and around the waters in New England. Uh, matter of fact, I never remember actually being too warm at sea here. I do remember it snowing uh, sideways uh, in, in, in the cold. And we do say that there are sailors, there are submarine sailors, and then there are New England submarine sailors, which are frankly the meanest animals in the jungle. So uh, I'd like to first recognize the great congressional support that we get at this kind of conference. Um, you know, listening to the challenges, participating, uh, fundamental partners really in everything we do. I mean, at, at the end of the day, it's their Navy that we're, uh, we're advising them on and supporting, and, uh, and their partnership is critical. Also like to thank the event organizers for pulling this together with a focus on uh, innovation. This is my first Saniti event, hopefully the first of many uh, going forward. And I know that Senator Whitehouse is, is following me uh, on this agenda, and he's an enormous advocate for, uh, for middle class values and the opportunities you know, throughout all phases of life from childhood to senior citizenship. I'd like to say that your Navy uh, is the key element in setting the conditions for those. Uh, for those that remember Vice Admiral Lopez, long since retired, uh, who loosely had a previous iteration of my job, he used to say that the, the fundamental foundation of quality of life is, is living free. Um, so we feel it's our responsibility to protect those conditions. And my wife and I uh, recently binge watched the first two seasons of Man in the High Castle. <clears throat> now I'm not sure it's a Golden Globe candidate, um, but it is an interesting if not sobering series of how uh, we might be living had we lost World War II. So, you know, I don't want to start off with too much drama here, but you know, as we um, forge into this era of great power competition, uh, we should at regularly ask ourselves, you know, what is our freedom worth? And when we know that, that there are those beyond our shores plotting against us, building up their arsenal, and building their alliances against our, our way of life, if not our very existence. <clears throat> so 
so what is it worth? Um, I personally think it's worth everything. So when we built the shipbuilding plan last year, the FY19 shipbuilding plan, probably the most detailed shipbuilding plan we've ever put out, um, we started with a historical review back to 1955. And we only went back that far because the, the accounting kind of fell apart uh, as we, we pushed further back. <clears throat> and what we were looking for were trends and characteristics as we hopped between larger and smaller navies over the last 60 years. And we also looked at the amount of money historically spent on the Navy as we went through those different cycles. And we learned some things. Uh, first, we learned how disruptive our approach to shipbuilding has been on you, the industry. Uh, and we've endeavored to fix that by setting some baseline acquisition profiles that frankly will probably take a few iterations of shipbuilding plans to really uh, screw down tightly uh, that we can support. But we also learned that in constant year dollars, the Navy has remained relatively financially flat uh, over the last 60 years. So you put that in terms of uh, GDP, we've lost about 75% of our buying power. And the same for our research and development accounts. Meanwhile, the federal budget grew 600% and the Navy budget grew something a little over 20%. Uh, we learned that the, uh, the interest on the national debt today is more per year than the entire Navy budget. That's just the interest. We learned that the overall federal budget goes up per year more than the entire Navy budget. And that's just the incremental change from year to year. Uh, so why is this important? Um, because I believe as we continue to add fidelity to the cost to own and operate a Navy, especially a larger Navy, uh, we're finding that cost is gonna be the central challenge. 65% <clears throat> of our budget today goes to operating sus sustaining today's Navy which is a lot smaller Navy by about 25% of what we're aspiring to grow to. So uh, what we're willing to spend in context with what we spend on every, everything else may actually be the central question going forward. And, I'll, and I'll, I'll caveat that with, and believe it or not, I am actually a big advocate for a less expensive Navy. And I think we can become less expensive, at least uh, less expensive per dollar that we spend. But I'm a much bigger advocate for the capable Navy that we need uh, going forward. So pretty much since the, the War of 1812, we have committed to and we've invested in an away game Navy. And uh, I think most would agree it's been a very effective strategy on how we choose to keep the fight away from the U.S. shores. But unfortunately, that is the most expensive type of Navy that you can own and operate. Um, so just a few thoughts to shape my remark. And on these slides, uh, I'll try not to let this turn into just a stream of consciousness as I come up here. As you heard my bio, my, my bandwidth is spread pretty thin. Um, but I will tell you first and foremost, it's up to us in this room. Um, Navy, industry, academia, Congress, working together as partners and supporting each other as partners. You know, historically, if we're waiting for a windfall to help build this Navy, we would, we would show that that's not probably gonna happen. Um, but although we're probably not going to see a large budget increase, uh, we are seeing unprecedented congressional support uh, bolstered by a national defense strategy by Secretary Mattis that is clearly maritime centric. Congress has worked very hard uh, to improve the funding of defense and the Navy in particular. Uh, starting with the uh, Bipartisan Budget Act of last year, which required tremendous skin in the game from both sides of the aisle. <clears throat> And the very promising potential this year of actually getting an appropriations bill before the start of the fiscal year, which gives us the, the opportunity to leverage all 12 months of the fiscal year to execute our very complex programs, <clears throat> which we've learned is equally as important as the actual dollar value behind them. Congress has also worked very hard with the Navy in particular uh, to improve our accelerated acquisition in addressing our urgent out of cycle requirements for the warfighter. Together, we have secured support for internal reprogrammings, below threshold, above threshold uh, reprogrammings, requests for additional appropriations, and very strong support for our uh, rapid prototyping program to the point where they've actually uh, added money to our rapid prototyping fund. So this allows us to move between budget years on capabilities that we need to get fielded quickly and not have to wait for the next cycle of, of approval, continuing resolutions, repeat until dead. 
But all that said, we still need to get more efficient with how we spend uh, and show a, a true response to the responsiveness of Congress. We, industry, Navy, we need to stay aligned. We need to be very consistent in our messaging. We need to build trust and confidence with Congress and the public. And we need to drive out uh, overhead costs that add no value to our programs. We must forge ahead on, with our new ideas on how to best use our capital investments. And above all, we must continue to partner in innovation, which is the theme of this conference. So let's innovate. Uh, long history of Department of Defense and the Navy coming to academia and an industry with what we call the wicked hard problems. In the early, world, early years of World War II, the Allies' two most pressing problems were the crippling U-boat war up in the North Atlantic and the Luftwaffe attacks on Great Britain. The combination of investing in radar and the breaking of the Enigma code pretty much got us to where we needed on the U-boat problem. But for the Luftwaffe, it was a matter of predicting the future where an aircraft uh, would be so it could be shot down. Radar could provide data to calculate the trajectories. And with the servo mechanism, you, you could actually slew the gun to predict where the plane was going to be, kind of shooting ahead of the duck. It sounds very simple today, but in resolving this, researchers developed a broader understanding of the relationship between information and noise, order and disorder, and formed the basis of information theory. Uh, they focused on issues of communication and control between men and machines and how they interact for purposeful action leading to the field of cybernetics. These ideas were very progressive uh, for their time, but I will tell you the time is now, now. Uh, finding that signal in the noise, man-machine teaming, machine learning, and, and intelligent systems. Uh, you've heard the CNO probably say many times, the United States has not been in a competitive situation probably for the last 25 years. And now that we're back in the game, uh, the pace of the game has increased. And he often uses, if he, if he was challenged, to use one word to describe that pace, it would be exponential. And we, play, we see this playing out everywhere. Uh, we're expecting mega cities to grow by about 25% uh, by 2030 all within 100 miles of the coast. <clears throat> We've seen a 400% increase <clears throat> excuse me, uh, in maritime traffic over the last 25 years. Uh, aquaculture production has gone up 13-fold. And now uh, we kind of ca characterize intercontinental telecommunications uh, traveling across the undersea cables <clears throat> at a level of about 99% of all traffic. So that path to the cloud that we think about actually runs underwater. Uh, not to mention lifespans have doubled, food supplies have quadrupled, and Moore's law has gone uh, literally crazy. Um, we recently just crossed the, uh, the 20 billion I.O. connected devices in 2017, expected to hit 30 billion devices in 2020, and then probably doubling again by 2025. Uh, 23 exabytes of information was recorded and replicated in all of 2002. We do that in days now. So putting this in the context of the future Navy, um, first, there's a broad consensus across a number of studies that the US Navy needs more ships so that we can continue to provide the timely options to, uh, to national leaders in areas that matter. But more ships uh, isn't enough. <clears throat> uh, what a platform can do and how it can affect how it can create an effect has become increasingly more important. So put another way, a 355 ship Navy today with today's technology <clears throat> is insufficient for maintaining maritime superiority in the future, even in the near future. So we won the Cold War on innovation. Um, there's a misnomer out there that we outspent the Soviet Union. Um, the reality is we out-innovated them. Their only response was to build more to compensate for a more capable U.S. Navy. Uh, and it was a strategy they could not sustain. And it's a very strong characteristic of an away game Navy that you have to, above uh, and first off, invest in advanced capability ahead of platforms. We need the platforms because the world is big and there's places we need to be. But what they can do when they get there is, uh, is uh, even more important. So that means we need to think hard about the capabilities that will give us the advantage we need in the future. This is where the culture of innovation and our continued partnership is most important. And you're going to see a distinct shift in how we design our capital assets, our ships and our aircraft, the pieces that will be around for decades, focusing more on adaptability and creating landing pads for future capability. We're focusing more on what we call SWAP-C, uh, space, weight, power, and communications. 
uh, and, and large design margin, meaning we're building in capacity for the future unknown capabilities we're gonna have to bring onto these platforms. We're really just trying to only invest in what we need regarding speed and stealth, you know, the basic survival uh, elements of the platforms, leaving shorter lifespan advanced capability to run in parallel. You know, building trucks, if you will, and then separately pacing the threat with capability for those trucks. So I like to use the iPhone analogy. The phone is the truck. Uh, the secret sauce of that phone are the apps that you can put on to get whatever capability you need and then just as quickly remove and replace them with something else. We also have to build in sustainment and logistics um, and adaptability. Efficient maintenance and supportability must be built into these platforms. Things like the, uh, the Ohio class logistics trunk, you know, large portions of the ship that you can remove to create access to quickly adopt new technologies. Ideally, the goal would be in one deployment cycle, you can completely reconfigure a ship. Not one overhaul or one depot cycle, but a pier side, uh, series of maintenance events, getting a ship ready for deployment, you can completely reconfigure it for a different part of the world. <clears throat> the key to maximizing naval power, uh, and, and we've talked about this before, is tying all this together and networking these platforms and the sensors and the payloads to include autonom autonomous systems. When we do that, the sensors and the payloads become services to the entire network, and, and we extend the reach and influence of each individual platform. We can expand, we can contract, and we can heal. <clears throat> and we can quickly adapt. This is how we get to the continuous non-linear capability improvement. More hardware is linear. Netted hardware is geometric. We're paying lots of attention to communications uh, in all elements of what we do. And this includes uh, industry and just their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, we have to have our robust, robust communications networks, and these signals must remain covert and protected. The data they carry must be incorruptible, or if corrupted, reconstructable, and the networks are the key. Establishing data standards and data hygiene, uh, giving us the confidence that we can actually execute these advanced kill chains or know when we can't. <clears throat> Just as the commercial industry is banned with challenge in the ex explosion of the Internet of Things, the vast amount of data we would push to the data lakes exceeds our current network bandwidth. To transmit one petabyte of, of uh, data off of one of our command and control ships would take an extraordinarily long time today. So data compression and sensor processing at the edge of the network, you'll hear me mention that again here in a minute, uh, can help solve these challenges. And then if we do solve the problem of moving these vast amounts of data agilely, then there's the problem of um, there's just too much information to make sense of. So you know, be careful what you ask for and what are we gonna do with this information once we can move it. So the CNO often refers to retired Air Force Colonel John Boyd's theory of decision cycle used in combat called the OODA loop, uh, the observe, orient, decide, and act. Uh, Boyd's thesis was that the victor in battle would be the one that can operate inside the other's uh, OODA loop. <clears throat> so our advantage has been pretty much the first O, the big O, the observe. Uh, we've had the best sensors, satellites, radars, sonars, um, and we saw this advantage play out uh, in the Gulf War where we could, we could see in the dark. Uh, we, could, we could maneuver through a featureless desert and not get lost. We could put a precision ordinance on target over 90% of the time. But today, the Satellite surveillance cameras, precision navigation, it's, it's pretty much ubiquitous. Everybody has access to that same data. Uh, I'd say we still have an advantage, but it's, it's a slight advantage. Uh, of the roughly 1,500 satellites operational in orbit today, nearly a third of them have been put up since 2010, and 60% of those were put up by countries other than the United States. So while we need to continue to develop our ability to observe, uh, we're really shifting from an era of precision uh, to an era of decision, uh, or more specifically, decision space, or more specifically than that, shrinking decision space, and how do we continue to preserve the advantage of the ability to act on the information that we get. Uh, two key technologies that we're very interested in that we think will help enable that advantage shouldn't be news to this group, but artificial intelligence and uh, quantum computing, and they kind of go hand in hand. <clears throat> An intelligent agent that integrates the vast sensor data, correlating tracks, flagging hostile intent, discriminating interfering contacts, and of course making recommendations on courses of action is the artificial intelligence that we need, all performing at the speed of light 
the only thing slowing them down is the 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 actual human in the uh, the OODA loop. Uh, but that human's going to be there a while. We're pretty confident of that. Uh, so as we design these uh, AI engines, we must recognize that a human and machine we're gonna we're gonna have to act together as a team. And as with any AI conversation and challenge, uh, there's a trust issue. Uh, you know, a hospital ship that is confused by a warship is a very big problem in my business. And we need to get through that and, and, and build the confidence. Uh, the other less obvious challenge in AI is power consumption. The amount of power it takes to actually drive these algorithms and these AI engines. <clears throat> I suspect many of you are familiar with the the AlphaGo challenge, where the uh, the artificial intelligent algorithm um, beat the World Go AlphaGo champion in China, and beat him repeatedly. Um, what is less obvious is it took a warehouse of servers and kilowatts of power to drive that engine, versus the single human brain you could hold in your hand that maybe is consuming 25 watts and is probably partially distracted. It is a human brain after all. And this guy has family, probably working on his golf game, whatever it may be. <laughs> probably not completely committed to the AlphaGo problem that the, that the counterpart machine was doing. So how do we scale that down to a forward deployed Navy and make it operational on the edge of the network? Quantum computing is also another area where we see tremendous opportunity. Um, you know, this widespread and what many would believe crucial encryption, uh, I think we're on a very near-term path uh, that that's going to be obsolete, that you're not going to be able to sustain encryption. Um, so how do we take advantage of that? Not how do we run from it, how do we take advantage from that? Uh, things like quantum entanglement, making unhackable encryption models impervious to eavesdropping, or using the quantum phenomena, phenomenon uh, superposition. Uh, where we could process all of our sensor information simultaneously, quickly finding that signal to noise that we're looking for, and then planning the optimum engagement. Uh, we're investing heavily in this, and these are areas of big interest as we go forward. Any questions beyond that, you gotta kinda go out to Spay War and uh, have a clearance. <clears throat> so I, I just quickly went over some of the, uh, some examples of where we're heading and what we're trying to get after here in the Navy. So I'd like to now shift to a few observations regarding the hurdles uh, to getting there that we, uh, that we really have to tackle together. First of all, uh, I, I think the responsibility is largely on the Navy, uh, probably DOD on, in a larger effort, but uh, for the areas that, that we control, that we can build, that we continue to build an environment uh, for our partners, for you to innovate, uh, and innovate with confidence, and understanding that, uh, that we're gonna listen and that we're gonna invest. <clears throat> uh, I think we need to do things like support our national labs. Uh, you know, the Lawrence Berkeley's, Los Alamos, uh, Brookhaven, Fermi, Oak Ridge, just to, n just to name a few of them. There's real magic in those labs. And the young engineers that find themselves working in these organizations, uh, although we can't really advertise a lot of what we do, once they're on the inside, they don't want to leave. So we, we very much still have the secret sauce. It's just scaling that to a level that we can uh, productively work at a, at a much higher scale. <clears throat> Clearly, we need to invest more uh, government-wide in research and development. You know, at least to a recognizable percent of our GDP. Uh, our adversaries are heading north in this area, we're heading south. And it's um, very much an artifact of laziness and denial, in, in my, my opinion. And, and frankly, uh, you know, I've been a, a, a big uh, advocate and I have pushed industry hard to invest their own IRAD, but the reality is we can't expect industry to carry all the research and development. Um, and it's just for the simple fact that, you know, unless there's a competitive commercial market, um, there just often isn't a real business case for you to do that on the commercial side. <clears throat> so meaning that you could go out of business. Um, and that leads me to my next point of, I, I really think we need to look at how the defense industry competes. And I'm all about competition. Um, when I was back at N97 working on the, what we call the Tactical Submarine Evolution Plan, you know, we were really looking for opportunities to bring more competitors into um, the undersea arena of, of advanced development. <clears throat> 
But regarding the, the, the total scope of business, the, num the numerator, if you will, uh, over the, whole, the, the entire number of players, the denominator, compared to the commercial market, it's a pretty, it's a pretty scary ratio. So in response to that over time, because we could and we could be lazy, um, we've created a very risk averse environment. You know, we've, uh, we favored lethargy, uh, protests are common, recompetes are common, burdensome contracting. Um, don't get me started on the technical warrant process. Uh, I mean, all these things collectively are killing us and killing our speed and our ability to maneuver. So we need to, I think we need to partner as one team. Um, you know, if you, if you win, uh, it can't be for the sake of the demise of a different company, and you're one that may be vital at a different time and place on a different technology. We want to keep as many players on the field as we can uh, without bringing everything to a stop. And similarly, we have to keep a careful eye on a very fragile second tier industrial base that could easily go down with its prime. So, um, you know, can we, should we, uh, as a defense industry, get more closely aligned with commercial technology? You know, I don't know. That's always a raging debate uh, with the uh, the antagonist saying that well that'll, that'll bring the defense technology down to a level of parity, and clearly we don't want we don't want to do that. But I still think there's opportunity to leverage the te technical baselines to save cost, uh, to pr promote more competition in the denominator, and, and and a thought that you know we really haven't been forced to think about in a long time uh, to have these partnerships in place. Uh, should we need to surge to the commercial capacity in time of war? You know, kind of a preemptive freedom's forge, if you will, and maybe a hedge against inaccurately predicting what our adversaries are going to do. I mean, I'm told, you know, the auto industry couldn't build a modern military aircraft. Um, I don't know. And I'm not sure that's true. Uh, but I suspect they could build something for us that we could posture them to join the fight if they had to in time of need. And uh, I'm not sure how much we've really asked that. Uh, we need to continue to look for opportunities uh, to learn through iterations. And this is, you know, very much contrary to the to way the Navy has approached their programs uh, over time, which is, you know, the very risk averse, let's go slow, let's not be in a hurry. Um, we need to get to the, you know, the rapid experimentation rule, uh, rule. the worlds of the Edisons, the Einsteins, Bezos, um, Elon Musk. Determine what's good enough for now and then um, make the decision to field it and then iterate it. Mark Zuckerberg, you know, he was recently quoted as saying that at any given time, there are 10,000 Facebook versions running simultaneously, um, all providing information, all providing feedback, all making the entire collective uh, that much better. So we're not Facebook, we know that, but clearly there's a lot we can learn there. And I think we can commit to a technology after a few iterations, because we'll know early whether or not it's better than what we have. And then we can kind of ride the technology curve there as it matures through fielding. You know, the CNO's challenge to all of us, me included, is to reach operational capability in 10% of the time. Uh, that's not 10% faster, that is one tenth of the time. Um, this is a rule his counterpart in Israel lives by. Maybe you've heard him say this, um, but I think it's a very powerful statement. Um, you know, the Israelis live in a competitive environment. And if you've ever visited the Golan Heights, that's code for a hostile environment. So their very survival depends on their ability to outmaneuver their neighbors, to be more agile with their capability and to get it fielded faster. <clears throat> I mean, we look at things like the, see things like the DDG-1000, the Joint Strike Fighter, just general shipbuilding weapons and, and sensors. I mean, we kind of get these things right in time. Um, but I think we'd benefit from iterations where we feel quicker, learn, and make adjustments. My sense is we could get it just as right in one-tenth of the time and then iterate it to get it even more right in less time. So in the geostrategic world, um, you know, I, I'm, uh, I was kind of a closet futurist for a few years. I, I would read these you know, books like The Next Hundred Years, and uh, I, I'm not sure how much weight anybody puts in those things. I think the last book I read, I think by now, I think Mexico was supposed to have taken over the United States. So. Um, the point is that, you know, beyond about 10 years, the predictions just dramatically fall apart because humans are humans and they, and they are largely unpredictable. Um, so why would I invest in anything uh, beyond 10 years that I don't have to? So this is kind of the truck versus capability. I, I have to build the trucks 
And by the way we build them, they have the potential to be around for 40 or 50 years. Uh, it doesn't mean we have to keep them around for that amount of time, but wouldn't it be great to get the maximum return on investment by building in capabilities that allow us to load the apps when we need them and keep the, keep the, uh, keep the truck relevant? And we're not sure we can reform ourselves to do this. We think we're going to have to do big jumps over the process uh, within the scope of the authorities granted to us to really shake up the, the whole way we approach. And, and we're, I mean, we're doing what we can. We're, um, you know, for those that have been involved in some recent um, uh, requirements to, um, to contract uh, efforts, uh, some of the bigger efforts like the, the FFGX or MQ25, uh, for those involved in those programs, you can see a, a dramatic change in how we're approaching these requests for proposals. We're actually working with industry early uh, having industry tell us how to ask the question so we get the response that we both can live with. And it's, uh, it's had the collateral benefit of dramatically shrinking down the timelines. Um, Lorazem is another great example of how we got that thing turned around very quickly. Several of our laser systems are coming along uh, much more quickly than in the past. How about no more than one year from requirement to contracting or even six months? You know, what, what does that look like and what does that take? <clears throat> and empowering our people. Um, applying pressure to all levels of our workforce is really the only groundswell effect that's going to make this all work. Uh, forcing people out of their out of their stovepipes, you know, and there's going to be a degree of tolerance that's going to have to be accepted when you do that, uh, when mistakes are made on behalf of the greater good. Uh, there will be some skin needs. I mean, I got some skin needs. Uh, I, I will tell you, um, you know, a recent example in one of our accelerated acquisition programs. Um, our program manager did a very good job. Um, matter of fact, did such a good job uh, that we skipped into the previous fiscal year, not recognizing that we legally were not allowed to do that. Um, I thought it was great. Congress did not. Um, <laughs> so, so we had some conversations, and uh, and it, and it was okay. We, we took some lumps, and we learned a lot, and we were able to protect the com the company involved. And, uh, and we learned a lot going forward about the constraints of one of our partners, in this case, uh, Congress. So we're going to be better forward in the end. Um, so maximizing congressional authority has already granted us is also another area I'm very focused. I, I still don't think we're, we're taking the maximum benefit of what we've already been authorized to do. And I'm eager to ask for more authorities, because I suspect there are more out there that we could, we could grant. And I suspect they're receptive to that. So finally, I'll say a few words on talent and people. And I want to be clear that this isn't an afterthought. It's just really the final thought. Um, you know, I've heard, uh, I've heard the CEOs uh, across our defense industry uh, discuss the challenges and the competition for talent. You know, it, <clears throat> the global competition. You know, you go to a lot of the trade shows around the country, and you'll see many of the booths are foreign companies. Uh, many of the people walking the floors are, 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 are foreign partners. Uh, everybody is mining for the same, same talent. The Navy is no different, uh, just like the other services. Only I am operating under a tremendous constraint of I have to mine talent out of the 1% of Americans that are even qualified to serve in the military, uh, STEM or otherwise. Uh, so it is, a, it is a tall order. So working together to create enthusiasm for what we do uh, is going to help all of us. And I can help you generate that enthusiasm. So if they, if they don't qualify to serve for, for whatever reason, it could be allergies, they can certainly serve in a different capacity working for industry where we really need the town. Um, we need to contribute, and this is big on the Navy, uh, to what is often called the innovation ecosystem. You've heard that mentioned before, I'm sure. Um, by supporting diversity of thought, the expansive thinking, uh, and really an education spirit that just kind of screams to young engineers and scientists, this is where you want to be. This is where you want to work. Uh, to me, this is sustaining an environment where uh, not that ideas don't just survive, they thrive as we go forward. It, it's really what makes us Americans so unique and, and sometimes we just need to step back and kind of look at the environment we get to operate in. I kind of call it the controlled chaos of a receptive um, innovation and learning environment. And, and you have to have the American spirit and culture to allow that to go. Um, you cannot replicate that elsewhere. 
So we need to let that ride. And it cannot be financially constrained. It cannot be uh, authority constrained. Uh, we want you know, anarchy in our thought as we go forward. And finally, I personally believe, this is a, a personal opinion, um, I think we really need to protect the intellectual sanctity of our U.S. universities. Um, we need to build our team first. We need to invest in us. Uh, you know, look to American citizens when you're trying to uh, give out scholarship funding. Uh, build our team above all others. So in closing, uh, I know I covered a lot of areas there. I promised it would be a little bit of a stream of consciousness. Um, but these are just some technologies, uh, innovation ideas that we think are, are fundamental to keeping this uh, Navy uh, more competitive than, than the adversaries. And you're going to see these themes become more and more prevalent. Uh, we have some great leadership in the Navy right now between the Secretary of the Navy and the CNO. Um, you're going to see this in our formal reports to Congress as we start capturing these ideas that we really need to get after going forward. I would recommend that when we hold these kind of conferences that there is a mechanism uh, to formally capture you know, maybe the top 10 items where you see um, hurdles to achieving what I'm talking about. And I don't mean generalities. Uh, here, I mean, I was on the, on the, at the social, I came in late yesterday, I got the last hour of the social, within 15 minutes, um, at least four or five people complained to me about the contracting process. Okay, I'm not a contracting officer, um, and I didn't sleep in a Holiday Inn Express last night. Um, but I'm willing to take that fight on, and you got guys in here like Dave Johnson, uh, you heard Hondo Gertz last night, uh, you cannot pick a better team to get after these things, but we need specifics. Um, what contracts, what programs, call them out by name, call out Navy people by name. Uh, we're not going to go fire anybody. We're going to rally around them to figure out their perception of these hurdles, and then we're going to work together to remove them. Uh, I think if we don't do that at the end of one of these conferences, it's a, it's a huge lost opportunity. So with that, I'm wrapped up. I'm happy to take any of your questions. Thunderous applause. <laughs> So the, the question is uh, whether or not um, my remarks are publishable. Yes, they're not in publishable form right now. If you look at these things, they're a mess. Um, but uh, uh, we can clean them up, and we'll, we'll I'll send them to you, and I'll, I'll leave it up to you on how you want to uh, promulgate them. I know how to get a hold of you. Sir. Admiral, we hear a lot about uh, rapid prototyping, and I believe that the real issue is how do we move from prototypes to deployed systems on these platforms? Can you talk a little bit about uh, rapid acquisition, what's being done in the area of rapid acquisition? Uh, so the, the, the first question is how do we go from um, prototyping to fielding? Uh, and this is an area that, that OPNAV, where I work, and the Secretariat, where Admiral Johnson and, and Hondo Gertz uh, is the ASN, um, we, uh, we have put a lot of thought and discussion into that. Um, you know, the good idea factory is great, and we can prototype this stuff, but we actually have to do something with these ideas to get them out there. Not just to engender confidence in industry, but to actually deliver the capability. Um, so Secretary Gertz came from SOCOM, uh, where they kind of live in the world of rapid acquisition. and. Uh, and his idea, which I fully support, is let's, let's pass these risk decisions to the operators. Um, so you know, we are still a little bit mired in, all right, we do a prototype. Now we have to turn it into a program and all the tentacles that go with that. Um, his thought is, well, let's show the, uh, the warfighter what we have and ask them, is it good enough? And, and do they want to accept risk on um, a less than fully developed program? So the response, as you might uh, imagine, is absolutely they do. Uh, and he's working hard to kind of figure out how that will play out um, going forward. And I think you're going to see that, that turn quickly. I will tell you, um, if we're going to use this rapid acquisition uh, authority and the funds that Congress has given us, 
Um, typically, it's in an area that we know something. It's not going to be an S and T project. It's typically going to be an evolution of something that's already fielded that we can, you know, pull a few things together and create a whole new capability. So we have some sense of technical maturity as we run it through that program. So I, I think that's foundational to, to making that leap. Um, prototyping in the S&T world is experimental, and you just got to be careful what that tells you. Prototyping in um, what we call the RPED world is, is, is deliberate towards a, a fielded, uh, fielded capability. So um, some of the projects that we have in this system, and uh, I'll just you know, quickly describe when I talk about accelerated acquisition, we're very precise with our, our terminology when we say that. Uh, matter of fact, we have educated our program managers that just because you're exercising accelerated acquisition authorities, the 806 authorities, doesn't mean you're an accelerated acquisition program. Uh, that's a special designation held by the CNO and Secretary Gertz. And the, re and, the, and the only difference is there's no difference in authorities they exercise. The ones that are designated go to the front of the line for funding. Uh, and it's tied to an emergent war fighting gap that we got to feel quickly. So right now we have uh, six capabilities in there that span about 14 different programs. Uh, from uh, the family UVs, uh, the MQ-25 tanker is one of them, uh, our family laser systems, and some of our missile technology. Uh, things that we have clearly identified a gap, and here's the investment to fill that gap. So it's a pretty, and, and we, we will always pressurize to keep those numbers small. Uh, because that maximizes the impact of their funding priority to do that. If we make everything accelerated acquisition by designation, then we just kind of lose our prioritized funding of the entire requirements program. So we have to be careful how we do that. Sir. Hey, Admiral, you touched upon talent, which is probably one of the biggest challenges for most of the people in this room, <clears throat> whether it's research institutions or labs or companies. Uh, not only acquiring that talent, but training that talent mm -hmm. on an ongoing basis. So you asked to be specific. Any of these companies, academic institutions, research institutions, are looking for new innovative programs and have lots of recommendations to be able to acquire that talent and train that talent. What are your thoughts, advice, and suggestions on ways to make that happen? Um, I don't know. I think this group is pretty talented in here. The, uh, uh, a lot going on in here. Uh, I tell you, we have reorganized um, OPNAP over the last few years that is probably, uh, whether it was deliberate or not, created an environment for recognizing the talent and bringing it in. So I'm the N9 in OPNAV. Uh, other services don't have an N9, so I often have to explain to people what that means, that uh, most services operate in the world of N8. And we, we have an N8, that's our CFO uh, for the industry vernacular. Uh, but the requirements got so unwieldy, uh, uh, about 10 years ago we decided to break, break those two apart and do requirements separately and uh, resources separately. In doing that, all the resource sponsors came under N9. So we have N95, who's our only Marine General in the OPNAV staff, and these are all the two stars under me. And then we have N96, the uh, surface warfare, the air warfare, the undersea warfare, and then we have our special programs. But, but also what we brought in there is this uh, organization called N94, uh, N94, which is a separate hat for the Chief of Naval Research, Dave Hahn. And through that, we have created this uh, tremendous connective tissue between the resource sponsors and the talented engineers that we have uh, uh, just in the Naval Research Labs. And through there, that's our branch to technology. So uh, instead of just simply referring you to Dave Hahn and Naval Research Lab, I thought it was important to understand why that's important and why that'll work. Um, Dave sits with the resource sponsors now. He can't get away from us. Uh, so we have the opportunity to chase him around, and as he comes uh, forward with his S&T projects, and as he supports the developmental funding in his R&D for the, the, the programs that we're actually pursuing, uh, he's opening up this window, this, this talent pool across both Navy and, uh, and industry. So uh, anyone in the nine has access to that. So whatever program you're working on, you're tied to your resource sponsor through Dave Hahn. Uh, it's, a, it's, a thriving, it's a thriving window right now. Admiral, how are you?
radically different 30 year ship uh, Do we expect to see many refinements in the POM 20 uh, 30 year ship building plan as you've had it from here to kind of improve? Sure. So the, uh, the question was, um, with the effort we put in the FY19 shipbuilding plan and, and how we changed that fairly dramatically on how we approach shipbuilding, uh, at least how we're planning it out, is there going to be any other changes in the FY20 plan? So the answer is yes. Profiles won't look a whole lot different. Um, there's going to be a, a few different appendixes in it now. Uh, we're endeavoring to include every ship the Navy buys in the shipbuilding plan, not just the 355 accountable battle force ships. Um, we are endeavoring to capture what is the ownership cost of the Navy. Um, so we're very clear on what the overall investment's going to be and to see what, what, uh, what we're going to actually afford. Remember, in, in Washington, we work on this five-year budget window called the Future Years Defense Plan, the FIDUP. Uh, the shipbuilding plan works way beyond the five-year fit-up. Um, the FY19 plan illuminated the huge funding challenge of the, uh, the Columbia-class submarine that comes just beyond the fit-up. And it engendered a lot of healthy conversation before it even hit, hit the budget window. Uh, this is why this fidelity is so important. But we knew that, hey, look, uh, what we're putting into our shipbuilding accounts now, based on how we spend money, how we buy ships, how we build ships, we don't have enough uh, to sustain growing to a 355 ship Navy. So we want to capture that cost up front and we want to show the years that it's going to be the biggest challenge and then work with Congress on how we're we going to get after that. Uh, and then maybe we can't afford 355 ships. What can we afford? Uh, what are we willing to sacrifice? Without that kind of visibility, a program that has been wildly supported, like the Columbia class submarine, Without that fidelity and visibility, you don't realize that when that ship hits serial production, it crushes the entire shipbuilding account. And what are you going to do? You're just going to stop building everything else? Uh, not really an option. So, uh, uh, so what we're doing is providing visibility to attack these problems before it's a crisis uh, as it comes forward. And part of that, the evolution of that, is, is, is adding the fidelity of those costs. And when I say total ownership cost of a, of a ship, we don't really mean total. Uh, we mean the things that sustain that ship. So the, the, uh, the crew, uh, the maintenance cycles, the building costs. As we say, you know, it takes 30% to build a ship, 70% of the cost to operate it through its life. It's that 70% we really want to add fidelity to. So it doesn't include things like schoolhouses, uh, infrastructure. You know, schoolhouses are kind of tough to capture. If I train one pilot or 30 pilots, I still need a schoolhouse and an instructor to do that. So it's not as scalable as the direct cost of operating a ship. But we're going we're gonna to add some fidelity to that so we can have these, these healthy conversations on how to pay for it. Sure. You guys are going easy on me. So, Sean O'Connor. <laughs> Let me scratch that. <laughs> hey, sir, just a question. You talked about you, that O and the D. A lot of improvement there is going to come from software. How is, are you, or at least in the requirements world, looking at your models, your evaluation, to take a look and say that that's worth it? Because the real challenge here is when you improve, whether it's you know, how quickly an operator recognizes something, how quickly you know, to expand that decision space you talked about, mm -hmm. it's software. But what's the incentive? How do you know when you press the button and say, go, I want that? Yeah, that's an interesting question, and, and frankly, um, I don't think I've gotten my thought train that far down the tracks. Uh, we have been concentrating mostly on, you know, setting our data standards and environment so this software can can kind of explode with confidence and that it's compatible and we can communicate. Uh, you know, when I was in the development squadron in the submarine force. Um, you know, the things that would bring us to our knees were the interfaces between systems talking to each other. Just software trying to talk to software. Um, whether it was a proprietary hurdle um, or just, um, you know, an engineering challenge. So we've been working on that under the hood stuff to create the environment for that, for that to explode. And I will tell you that the CNO has been participating and, and Dave Hahn has been our principal member from the Navy side on the Defense Innovation Board which has been specifically software agility focused. Um, you know, how do you get the codes and how do you get them fielded quickly? Now, to your question on 
pushing the button and see what happens. Um, I think that becomes more of the legacy engineering side of software, uh, not the environment where it, where it survives. So interesting question, though. I'm going to carry that one back. Thanks. OK. I think I'm at the end of my rope here, Bob. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> so to speak. Thank you very much. There you go. A little token of our appreciation for everything you did for here today. Hopefully this will, won't be your last visit to no, us. No, I hope not. And uh, for everything you're doing for our country. Great. Thank you very much.